on this episode of the Business Communicators. I have not just theories anymore, I have evidence. I know what's going on and it's so big and it's so deep and it's really wild. I have to keep some of these cards close to my chest until I can get the FBI involved because the cops are just not cutting it anymore. They might be involved. You're listening to the Business Communicators. And now your hosts, Austin Stepp and Thomas Bain. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 5 of The Business Communicators. My name is Austin Staten, here alongside Thomas Bain this week on, uh, I guess, a pretty historic week. It's the, uh, the coronation, and that's what we're here to talk about, Thomas. You know, <laughs> it's the number one, uh, you know, business, marketing, communications podcast in the world. It is a huge that. PR play for the for, for the monarchy, so <laughs> makes sense. Makes well, sense. Like, well, like 15% of our audience comes from the UK, and I think like 20% comes from Canada, so maybe, maybe we should. We I don't should. Know. No, we're not going to do that. No, 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 no. But <laughs> anyways, if you want to follow our work, just search the Business Communicators on uh, Google and your webs. And of course, you can find us on pretty much all platforms. Just search at Biz Communicator. We're, we're active on some than others, but uh, yeah, just check us out. But Thomas, we are actually recording this episode on Thursday night. We don't have beers this time like we did last time. We need to lock down that. That, 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 yeah, that sponsorship happy hour, absolutely yeah. for it. But you know, as, as we recorded on a Friday night, because the breaking news, I, I like I said, it's in our LinkedIn post. Is I felt like it was like this week was like hold my beer and watch what we can do more in business communications. Yeah, yeah. both how to do it and how not to do it. Yeah, and we're we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. You know, we we've kind of discussed this a little bit before. I don't know that we've really touched on it a lot since two thousand twenty one, but just kind of how. Um, you know, agencies make good decisions, bad decisions, um, you know, influencers we've talked about, uh, you know, David Dobrik and his, his controversy that happened, uh, you know, what was it a year, year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we're going to dig into that a little bit deeper here in a moment. We've actually got a guest that's going to, to join us on the show. So we're going to go ahead and add her into the stream right now. We've got Meredith Lynch. She's an LA based writer content creator and uh meredith thank you so much for joining us on the podcast thank you for having me and uh we need to maybe send you like a road microphone so you can you know join our our whole club <laughs> <laughs> but but uh yeah so i guess just tell us a little bit about um you know kind of you what you do in terms of like writing and, and coverage i know you've got a large platform on on social media so you know why is digital media and kind of content creation your thing mm-hmm Yeah, great question. I have always been someone who loved media. I was like a kid that loved The Inquirer when I shouldn't have been reading The Inquirer. (laughs) And so I've always been sort of fascinated by pop culture. I, you know, have a bachelor's degree in communications. I'm getting an MFA in creative writing. And I am just a fan of double clicking on things. And I mean, probably to a fault. So I would say that a lot of my platform has been built around double clicking on things and digging deeper into things, whether I'm looking at what members of Congress are investing in meta and then at the same time calling for the TikTok ban. That was something I did recently. I I, I just love getting into the weeds and seeing what's there. And sometimes there's absolutely nothing there. But I'll say this. I found it very interesting this week when there was a post about Camilla Parker Bowles and the royal wedding. You know, it said the first slide was she was born in, you know, 1950, whatever. And then the next one is like, and then she married Prince Charles. And you're like, wait a minute. We missed a lot of time in there. (laughs) That was a very strategic move, royal family. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, you know maybe maybe cover up some of those inconvenient pasts. That's that's you know kind of what we all you know wish right. that we could do, uh, but not mm-hmm. all of us have that uh, the capability to scrub things on the internet. And you know one of the reasons why we actually wanted to bring you on this week is because I think you've been kind of um, your your at least TikTok account has been kind of thrust into the spotlight over the last you know few days um, due to kind of a, a controversy that I think has been brewing for the last several weeks and just want to be clear with our audience meredith is not the cause of the controversy it's the creator himself that is the cause of the controversy and we'll get into that here in a minute but i do want to kind of outline the situation and and then meredith i'm going to give you the opportunity to kind of clarify some stuff and just you know kind of give broader depth but there's a creator i believe he's chicago based uh and he works in the tech space Uh, i think i actually followed him when he was referencing his 
you know, experience working at Google, but his name's Ken Walks. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, he currently, I think, works a day job and then his startup, I guess, is his evening job. Uh, and that's called Foresight. It's an app. And uh, I guess he's the co-founder, quote unquote, and uh, CMO, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Anyways, over the last like month, he's been investigating murders across the United States. So he's also a detective uh, as well. But, uh, you know, I guess it started based on an experience that he had where he claims that uh, he was nearly abducted by, you know, being offered rides by two individuals. Um don't know, you know, the, you know, details behind that. But he started posting more and more info. It was something that, you know, he kept digging into and sharing videos on his TikTok account, I think for a better part of a month, if, if not a little bit longer. And uh, it, it became a viral sensation, if you will. I think his TikTok following increased from about 600,000 to just over 1.1 million <laughs> people within a short time frame. And it was gaining traction. And of course, we know that murder documentaries are incredibly popular on Hulu, Netflix, and so it just captivates our attention. And I think there were a lot of people out there that wanted this to be true, you know, that he was crime fighting, that he was, you know, uh, he was a, a, a tech guy by day and a, a detective at night. And, you know, people were kind of, I guess, rooting for him uh, and, and hoping that this was real. And who, who knows? It, it all could be. You know, we're not here to debate um, you know, what evidence he has, what evidence he doesn't have. We're going to talk about the communications aspect of this. But Meredith, um, over the last few weeks, you know, he started kind of mentioning plugs of his brand in context with the murder investigation. I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, and that's kind of where I found you. I think you showed up on my For You page so kind of explain how you, you know, were kind of alerted to this and, uh, you know, kind of what your coverage, I guess, has been over the past few weeks. I think like a lot of people, I at first was looking at the Ken story and thinking, oh, wow, like there's a serial killer in Chicago. I had no idea. And I have seen Ken around before, uh, wasn't a huge fan of his content, and I thought that there was something always like off. But once he started to say things like he, you know, was being contacted by private investigators, that he had been recruited by the FBI a couple of times, and he was showing sort of interesting emails that were supposed to show that, but they were really like do not reply emails, like the email that you'd get if you right. submitted an application. I just started to feel like something was off. And I also felt like if there was a serial killer in Chicago and he had cracked this case, which is what he said in one video, that it would probably, you know, I'm in L.A., but I think it would be on national news. Absolutely. 100 percent agree. Any serial killer, especially in today's world, would be on national news. Yeah. In Chicagoland, like just a massive, massive region. And, and that's where I found you is, you know, you kind of calling this out. And I do want to play a video. So if you're listening to this. Stay tuned. It's, you know, a minute 47 seconds. And Thomas, I don't know if you've seen this yet. Um, Meredith, I'm pretty sure you've seen a lot of videos, but I actually went through his TikTok account, downloaded a bunch of his videos and kind of compiled it, um, you know, just so people can hear, you know, kind of how this storytelling took place. And and just, you know, to Ken's credit, he's a great storyteller. Um, you know, he he's, he's very good at building a narrative, whether or not... Um, you know, there's some exaggeration that that remains to be seen. Um, but we'll go ahead and play this uh, clip real quick. There's obviously something happening in Austin, Texas, and I'm pretty sure I got it. I have been in touch with private investigator in Texas. I gave her the information that I had. I gave her the potential ringleader and it hit. I have not just theories anymore. I have evidence. I know what's going on and it's so big and it's so deep and it's really wild. I have to keep some of these cards close to my chest until I can get the FBI involved because the cops are just not cutting it anymore. They might be involved. You know what's crazy is my old manager from Yelp called me the other day and we were talking about something relating to my startup foresight. He lives in Austin now and when I asked him what he thought about all of this stuff is he didn't even know. This is a man married with two kids, lives in Austin. And he hadn't even heard about what was going on with this. 
somebody just knocked on my door and it's 8.30 at night on a Sunday. And so I go and I check in and it's not someone I know. And so I open and I'm like, what's up? And they're like, hey, my name's X and I'm a private investigator looking into the smiley face group. Um, and they asked me if I'd been in touch with a different detective that someone had put me in touch with. So uh, he actually just went back downstairs to secure his parking and uh, he's gonna come back. He's in a full black suit and everything, so. Um, yeah, I think this is about to get uh, very interesting. I know that lately most of my videos have been about this exact issue because to me, it's such a huge issue. And if the police and the news aren't gonna do anything to increase public safety about this and raise awareness, I'm gonna do it myself because at the end of the day, we are all just walking each other home. But there's been a lot of really cool things happening in my life that I'm gonna share. If you didn't know, I'm the co-founder and the chief marketing officer of a travel tech, FinTech startup called Foresight. And today I closed our first preferred partner. I hope you're ready for this then, because last night at three in the morning, I cracked the case. This is not a theory. I have proof. It's hard not to laugh. It, it is, especially when it went from Chicago to Austin, because we are. That was my editing. So, to, well, but in general, growing up in Texas, and I grew up just south of Austin, have a ton of friends there. That if there was a serial killer on, on the loose, even a rumored one, I would know about it in about 10 seconds via text message, phone calls, everything else in between. So it's just funny. Are you part of the smiley face gang? Thomas? No. <laughs> I, I'm smiling now. <laughs> the thing that I thought was crazy about that, and you know, Meredith, I'll let you hop in here in a second, is when he, he says, I have to go to the FBI because the police aren't doing anything about it. Maybe they're in on it. Like, who, who makes those claims? I mean, it, you know, I know that can over the past few days has threatened a few creators, um, you know, with direct messages um, suggesting that he's going to sue for defamation, which, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, but when you make claims like that, you know, suggesting that Chicago PD or Austin PD are involved in these disappearances, like check yourself. It, it's, it's literally insane to me. Would have been more believable if you'd have said like the CIA. No I'm kidding. <laughs> It very much reminds me, though, of, you know, all the Netflix series that go viral right now. It, it sounds like something out of a movie. It sounds too good to be true because it is. And I think to your point, Austin, it's like at the, you know, wouldn't it be so great if this was true? But yeah. then you get into, well, is there really a smiley face killer? And that's a whole other question. Yeah, it's it's absolutely insane. And, you know, I you guys have the show notes, so you kind of see what order we're going to go in for this episode. But I do want to skip down the bottom of our show notes real quick, where we talk about internet sleuths and, and cyber vigilantes. So this is not anything new. Thomas, go ahead. No, and I was gonna say before we jump jump to this point, what's going through my head more than anything is is H.W. Wells from 1938. Yeah, War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds, where he's straight up asked, were you war aware of the terror? The terror your broadcast is like, no, it's the technique I use is not original. I've used the same thing before. And 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 they're like, well, shouldn't you have toned down the murder, the murder statements and those kind of things on there? And he's like, no, you don't talk about murder when you're storytelling toned down. And, yeah. and so I feel like we're just living in the past with bigger microphones, for lack of a better statement. 100%. 100%. And, and, you know, this internet sleuth, you know, the vigilante justice, if you will, it's nothing new. It's something that's been going on for many, many years. It's primarily, I think, on Reddit. That's, you know, where it lives. But we just look at recent examples. I mean, you know, there's that Boston bomber documentary that's out on, on Netflix right now. Highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't done so already. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there, there's, I think it was a few days into the investigation, uh, a lot of people were pinning um, the second bomber on Sunil Tripathi. Uh, and I guess he had ultimately been missing for a while. And then I think he had killed himself. I'm not sure the timeline on that. Um, but his face was all over the news, you know, Newsweek, NBC, BuzzFeed, uh, Politico, uh, all of these journalists suggested that, you know, he was possibly guilty, that he was the person behind it. We look uh, you know, to the Sandy Hook killing, uh, you know, the, the massacre that took away too many children's lives and, uh, and teachers' lives. But the killer had his brother's ID on his person. And, you know, that, that news leaked that, you know, it was this guy when in actuality it wasn't. And he had to go on Facebook and say, look, it's not me. I'm innocent. This is not me. And even more recently here in Houston, you know, we, we've, we, there was a TikToker that was involved 
with the Idaho murders, you know, the, the, the ones at the University of Idaho where four roommates were killed, uh, three roommates and a boyfriend were killed. And uh, this professor sued a TikToker uh, because she started posting videos in late November saying that her inner spirit told her that this professor was involved. Like, how ridiculous is it? And not every situation is like as as black and white. And I do think there is some good about, you know, public helping and investigations mm-hmm. and providing tips, but it has to be done through the right channels. And when you start doing it in the open on TikTok, on Reddit, there's no checks and balances. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. We have discussed it on the podcast, not just on the internet sleuths, even though I think we should call them a comic book character right now, the vigilante side of it. But just news, how many times have the news gone out and done it? And don't get me wrong, some of the news has done phenomenal things. I think with the with the leaks of the Ukraine war where the New York Times actually identified who released it yeah. an hour or so before the the CIA, FBI, all of those found out. I, I, I think there needs to be checks and balances, but I also think it falls on us because you read some of these thoughts and processes. And I feel like it's the the person that we're talking about is the crazy person who lived down the street from your grandmother who talked about people in their basement when none of the houses in the neighborhood have basements. And and, and it's just people latch on to one little thing, one little detail, and then it just continues to grow legs. And, And nobody, my old PR professor used to say, if it bleeds, it leads, be first, get the most news. And so so the news is now trying to beat each other instead of being credible at the back end of it. I'm interested what you're taking is, is this uh, off on the, off on the West coast. Yeah. I mean, Meredith, you were, you were, I, I think you were really fair in how you kind of reported it, but why was this something for you to, you know, that you felt that you needed to share with your audience and, and encouraging people, okay, maybe you should take a step back here for a moment. Just to your point, I think it's one of those things where We've seen a lot of media that's gotten hyped up where the thing that is not the most obvious answer is actually the thing, if that makes sense. So you see the documentary where it's like, yeah, everyone said that she had, you know, taken her own life, but we didn't believe it. And so for 25 years, we, you know, just kept charting once in a while that happens. But I think we're starting to become kind of almost hypnotized by that of like, oh, yeah, that's like, that's always what happens. There's always a deeper meaning. And I think for me, one of the things that really changed how I was reporting out on this was I heard from someone who is uh, a friend or excuse me, was was a friend of someone who died by suicide in Chicago and Ken was reporting that that he thought this person could have actually been a victim of the smiley face killer or whatever killer he he thinks is a serial, serial killer in Chicago. And they were like, this is actually causing a lot of pain and grief yeah. for this individual's family. And that was like where for me it completely shifted. Yeah, I think you've got to draw a line when there are real people involved, like real consequences involved real emotions um it's it's tough to to relive trauma um and i know a lot of people you know go through therapy they go through counseling and you know when they finally get past it and then it's viral you know people don't sign up for that you know this is it's very toxic and if you look at some of the videos a little more in depth like people's names are on there it's not like he's taking the effort to blur them out you know if he was doing something like that then you know sure he can talk about it but you know there there's He's not, you know, asking people for privacy or permission. And, and I think that's a little bit problematic. And, um, you know, kind of what is also, I guess, blown up over the last few days are a series of tweets that um, he has allegedly posted. You know, we haven't been able to independently verify these tweets because he deleted his Twitter account. Um, but we, uh, we believe strongly from the you know the source that gave us these these are accurate and you know you go back to a tweet from 2012 uh this tweet suggests quote it's not rape it's a struggle snuggle um he's made tweets that are misogynistic are racist um he he's got a quote in there saying uh i see a random 25 year old black man in the showers and i think maybe if i don't say anything he won't stab me 
Um, he has a tweet where he says, I'm going to kill my gay teacher. He's such a queer, no pun intended. I mean, the internet doesn't lie. The internet doesn't forget. Um, you know, even if you delete things, things are captured. You know, there's the Wayback Machine where you can go and verify URLs. Um, it, 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 life came at Ken very fast this week. And, you know, we, we've discussed that, who knows, maybe he is telling the truth 100%. The way he went about it, I think, is where I kind of want to focus on. And, and Thomas, um, you know, you do a lot of marketing and, and brand work. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on him integrating foresight into some of those TikToks that, you know, directly mention the investigation? I mean, uh, to me, that border that borderlines, you know, ethical uh, questions when it comes to comms and marketing. It, it does blur the line between it. And I know that when we're buying ads um, or ad spaces, we have to be very careful on what sites we're blacklisting, um, what companies I'm representing depends on what sites they are. I've gone as far to say, Hey, this cannot, this cannot be shown this ad, our company cannot be shown next to this TV program that's on network TV, just because the company what didn't want to be associated with that at all. Um, with him being at the CMO, you want to put your, your brand where the people are. Uh, but I don't know if, if I'm a travel company, I don't know if I necessarily want to be hundred percent with them unless it is, this is a fictional story. This is a story, a podcast, you know, you hear the true true crime podcast. It, it would be no different than advertising there. I think the fact that he was blurring the lines that this was his own, we've already established that he's all over the board. I don't know if I, if I'd want necessarily my brand attached to that. If I was the CEO, I'd been like, uh, don't do that. And, and in fact, you know, probably start working your way out of the CMO role just because of how easy it is to find people on LinkedIn. Um, that, that that's my take is is as a brand yes you want to be with people who are going viral and things like that but as a brand you also want to make sure that you do your due diligence to make sure that it meets your mission vision values statements um across the board so ethically eh, kind of kind of torn on that one smart not at all yeah i i fully agree with the the lack of smarts <laughs> on it and you know we do want to be clear that you know this this investigation has been covered by the actual press. Uh, Texas Monthly, which is a very um, well-respected publication here in Texas, it's got you know an international following, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, they ran a headline this week saying "Reality Check." There's almost certainly no serial killer in Austin, and uh, you know they they go into detail and say, um, you know, on TikTok, influencers presenting themselves as crime experts have generated engagement by posturing as advocates for victim families. Um, you know, they, they even reference Ken. They say there's so much going on here. And the worst part is it's accelerating. Ken walks. He was more than a million followers on platform explaining a recent viral video. Walks says he's, quote, turned down offers to work for the FBI because his impact on the ongoing murder investigations around the country is too great to abandon. Um, he claims the deaths in Austin are the work of a group and the ringleader whom he's already identified. Um, the post, I guess, which has received 200,000 likes, has been picked up and recirculated on the media. Uh, Texas Monthly goes on to say... The most compelling reason to believe there's no serial killer stalking Rainy Street is the police themselves, who have never wavered from their bottom line. The drownings of Lady Bird Lake show no signs of foul play. And investigators believe several deaths were accidental and several were suicides. Successfully killing that many people by drowning without signs of physical distress is almost unimaginable. Uh, to accept the idea that a serial killer is on the prowl in downtown Austin, you must first accept the notion that local police and the Travis County Medical Examiner are engaged in a massive criminal cover-up. I mean, so you got to take a lot of steps here. And I, I don't think we're getting there. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that kind of blows my mind, and, and Meredith, I, I want to get your takes on this. So the CEO of the company of Foresight, and again, it's a startup, um, they put their valuation at like $7 million for the company right now. Um, I pulled the SEC filings. I watch a lot of Shark Tank. Um, I could just imagine Kevin O'Leary right now, like, your valuation is ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. like it's it's insane when you look at how they value the company. Um, they value Ken and his marketing presence at at five hundred thousand dollars for the company. Um, the lead investor is a company called Heinrich Marketing, based in Denver. Uh, they value the marketing company's work for one point one million dollars. So Ken plus the marketing company account for one point six million dollars, roughly, of their seven million dollar valuation. 
how does marketing work uh, go into your company valuation? Like that's a cost that your company is spending. It's not a value that your company is creating. But anyways, their CEO, Stephen Eddy, mm -hmm. um, he posted uh, on a deleted, I guess, LinkedIn post um, that says the team has never achieved true virality when attempting to promote product centered content on a personal profile since the TikTok algorithm suppresses the organic reach of promotional sounding content. So Ken decided to try something new yesterday by quickly referencing foresight as a side topic at the end of an unrelated post. This maneuver clearly tipped the algorithm in our favor and the results have been truly astonishing. This clever formula is highly reproducible and Ken plans to start mixing a foresight reference into the end of every other post. Best of all, this marketing strategy comes at no cost to the company. Well, I think it kind of does when you say that, you know, he's worth $500,000 to the company. So not everything's free, but beyond that, it's a tone deaf response. And, and Meredith, I, I, I think you saw the post as well. Um, it, it's, what were your thoughts when you saw that? I mean, it to me, it just seems it, it's not just Ken that's tone deaf. It's Stephen Eddy, the CEO of the company. I a thousand percent agree. And I think that he is just as guilty in oh, all yeah. of this as Ken. Because he was probably pressuring Ken to do this. Yeah. This is probably why he, Ken was brought onto the company, because he already had a big platform. And he is not innocent in any of this. And I actually think, in a way... I feel a little bit badly for Ken because I think he's taking the fall for something that Foresight probably pushed him into doing and he was not alone in. Yeah. And they, I think, are you know probably feeling the impact of the app, but I don't think Stephen Eddy is feeling the impact that Ken is probably feeling right oh, now. Definitely not. And, you know, and I, I would I would feel a little bit more for the CEO if it was like, hey, this went live yesterday and it's less than 12 hours. He hasn't had time to research or anything like that. But then he goes and makes that comment, which basically says, oh, no, I know exactly what's going on. Keep doing it. Yeah. And for all we know, <laughs> Ken could have just, you know, casually mentioned foresight in a post and it could have been unknowing. You know, it mm -hmm. could have been he unwittingly did it. And maybe they saw that. All right. There's there's an uptick. You should maybe keep doing this. So. I actually wanted answers. I wanted answers. So mm -hmm. I reached out to Foresight. Uh, very difficult to try to find an email for him. Um, I reached out to Ken directly. And I reached out to Heinrich Marketing. And uh, Heinrich Marketing, Marketing um, is the lead investor for Foresight. And you might be wondering why a marketing company is being associated with this. Uh, it turns out the Heinrich president is George Eddy, um, Stephen's father. So there's some conflicts of interest there, but I reached out to them, um, all groups, with several, several questions, um, you know, asking if Ken was ever instructed by Heinrich Marketing or company leadership or investors to post, um, you know, foresight references into the ongoing investigation videos that he was doing. I asked if they knew which videos caused that viral spike. I they know the answer to that. Um, I asked if, uh, you know, basically why Stephen deleted post um you know whether or not heinrich marketing abides by the prsa code of ethics um i asked if ken was still employed i asked if uh, heinrich marketing is still affiliated with foresight sent these emails on tuesday may 2nd and as of thursday may 4th at 9 40 central time no response none so we don't have answers we can't give you any information um i i don't know that bothers me uh, I know we're not the New York Times, but if you're a marketing agency you know, that's been around for 45 years, has 85 employees, and you're involved in this too, granted nobody's talking about them right now, nobody's really talking about Stephen Eddy, I would think that you wanna, would want to get out in front of your potential damage to the reputation. Um, I mean, Meredith, you're a writer in LA. I mean, reputation's everything in LA. I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I am kind of surprised that they haven't even release some type of statement because they are, you know, getting a lot of feedback. I, I actually, I ask, I, I have a question for you, for both yeah. of you. Is it just like startup culture is so intense that is it kill or be killed? Well, Thomas, you have more insight on that. For me, I, my first job was working in athletics. Uh, second job was working for the fifth largest company in the world. And my job right now is 
top 50 in the world. So I don't really know startup culture, but Thomas. I, I've got, got a couple of startups and, and, and having a company that has ownership in a startup is not unheard of. It's you're almost trying to work favors. Those angel investors who know it's pro bono work for, for lack of a say and some X percentage come in. The hard cold cash gets a little bit different on that front of it. But there, there's that culture of break break shit and figure it out later. Um, just get it done. You know, you have you, you'll have somebody who is freshman in college trying to re- create a website and do SEO content on the back of it. Um, and, and then once they go through Series A, Series B, get a real investor online, then it's almost like, how do we fix this? All the shit that's broken. Um, and so, so that is kind of the culture is, Hey, it's not ready and fire. It's fire, fire, fire. Hey, wait, what were we trying to do? Oh, we, we got this little thing in there and it's been that way. You can read Steve Jobs's book. You can read any of the books and it's basically saying the exact same thing. Um, who knows who with money with a checkbook, what is their exit strategy? Um, and so, so yeah, it is. The culture is get it done. Let's figure it out. Um, let the bodies fall where they go. Not a good, not a good reference there, but not, not Ladyburg Lake. So, <laughs> but, but, but reality it is, is you're brought onto it. It's go, 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 go. You're not meeting it. You're cut loose. It's, it's even more cutthroat than working in corporate America um, across the board. And so, yeah, I, I yeah, again, it's, there's a whole lot of wrong all the way through. And then having a PR firm as an investor, a family member, everything else in between, that should have been the one raising the red flag all the way through as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, there are a lot of PR agencies that do a lot of pro bono work. You know, that mm-hmm. do work for free. Um, you know, Pierpont Communications here in Houston, it's uh, you know, 30, 35 employees. Um, you know, they do a lot of great work with charitable organizations, and you know, they're not charging anything. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask Phil Morabito this question, who's the CEO, but, uh, you know, do you, do you kind of mix the, the corporate funds, the corporate name, the corporate brand with a son, a family? Like, I totally get, you know, um, the elder George Eddy investing in his son. I totally mm-hmm. understand that. 100%. But when you've got 85 people whose jobs are at stake, and then you've got, um, you know, these, these alleged tweets from, you know, Ken, uh, you've got this controversy that's now surrounding. I think we're the first ones to bring Heinrich marketing into this, but I mean, gosh, what's what's the boundary between family, business, and startups? I mean, I don't know. You know, I think knowing Pierpont and also knowing Phil, I think he does do a pretty good job of Phil being more of the, this versus Pierpont, and Pierpont helps support a lot of that. But I, I'm on the same page you are, is... Support your family, support your friends, 100%. But then also have oversight into your brand rec- rec- recognition. The, the second that first one went viral, foresight was mentioned, we saw a spike in downloads, everything like that. That that agency should have been like, hey, we need to look into this and yeah. basically kill it. Because to your point, they are PRSA members and they are supposed to go by a code of conduct. And this violates that code of conduct without even blinking. And it's been years since I've read their code of conduct. Yeah. I, I wonder if, um, you know, what the actual employees at Heinrich think about this situation. Uh, I imagine a lot of their employees, especially the junior ones are familiar with TikTok and what's been going on. Um, I imagine they have some reservations, but, you know, can't bring them up because the, um, you know, the owner is involved. Um, so it puts them in a tough spot. That makes me wonder if the junior ones who are familiar with TikTok even know that their company is a sponsor. No, I don't founder, think so. Angel I, just, of it. I had nothing to do on Tuesday night, so I found the SEC filings. <laughs> but 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 to your point, the, those junior people, I'm I'm willing to bet that probably at the company, maybe a handful of people actually knew that they were a lead investor in a startup company in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Meredith, what's your take? Well, I will say one of the people who works there is. Steven's brother. So I don't know if he's let it slip in a meeting. He's also at Heinrich Marketing. And uh, I was enjoying the Instagram post where they were like, he's a proud homeowner. I was like, well, of course he is. <laughs> of course he's a homeowner. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it it reminds me of like, why do we like succession? 
if Great that TV. was a show Sydney about Sweeney, I mean. like <laughs> if succession was a show that was just like about like a bunch of people who worked at a company together it wouldn't be that interesting <laughs> <laughs> but it's not it's not a family yeah <laughs> yeah and that's and that's what makes it complicated and so mm. i think that's it's kind of it kind of parallels that in some ways mm. yeah i I I wish I wish Heinrich or Foresight had given us a response. Um, you know, something I you know, I understand that we are not the New York Times. We've sent several statements before for requests. We've gotten either background conversations, we've gotten uh emailed responses. Um, you know, we've had NFL athletes on here, we've had senior executives at Disney on here, reporters on here. Um we are a tr essentially a trade publication for the communications mm -hmm. and marketing industry. You know, if, 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 you know, I work in energy, if uh, natural gas intelligence reaches out to us, yeah, they're not the New York times, but they cover our industry. The, the people that listen to our show, you know, we've got the data, you know, they're mm -hmm. 34 to 50 years old. They, they own companies. Um, you know, they are senior executives at these marketing companies. Um, you know, they're going to be looking to do business with, you know, maybe maybe Heinrich marketing on some of their projects, and if you don't get out there and squash this, uh, that's that's problematic. I'm shocked we didn't even get the. We have no comment at this time. Well, yeah, you never email. do that. As uh, you know, you, you know, just say we're actively investigating. You know, but you get my point. Is yeah. something to say that we received it versus? Yeah, well, I know they opened it because I I have click throughs. So um, yes. Data and we've also seen it hit our website from yeah. IP addresses coming from Denver. So it happened. It. And I know Ken's open the email too. But um, so I, I want to kind of do our um, final takeaways. But before we do that, I do actually want to share the uh, the apology video um, that Ken posted on his channel. Uh, and this was actually um, really, I guess, in response to a lot of the, the work that Meredith has done, uh, you know, in causing this to go um you know become more publicer uh to quote another uh tiktoker uh that, that's out there um so i'm going to share uh this this video and i just want to get both of y'all's takes on this apology i'd like to take a moment to address something that has come to a head over the last week as many of you know this investigation has been my all-consuming passion over about the last month and what started as my honest effort to bring more awareness to a serious public safety matter my reporting on this topic has since turned into a contentious subject, and I now realize that it's not my place at all to continue chasing this story despite my own personal connection to it with those two attempts on me. I, I bit off a lot. <laughs> I haven't been sleeping as much as I should. I've burnt myself out, and I frankly got a little bit lost in the sauce over this story. I acknowledge that it was insensitive to reference my startup on those two occasions and posts pertaining to this case. Uh, I'm a passionate guy who's passionate about the stories that I follow and of course about the content that I make. But I made a mistake by intersecting those two parts of my life and I want to apologize for the families impacted for having overlapped this other part of my life in this, this in an inappropriate setting. It won't happen again. And the information about the suspects that my team and I were, have been able to find has been passed to the proper authorities. I've decided to no longer post about this story publicly to prevent further conflict. I. I care so much about this case, I really do, but I realize that I can't report on it while balancing this other pursuit and my life. So, thank you. Couldn't even look into the camera. He was reading a text. He was lost in the sauce. And that's not the first time the firm has used that, that, uh, that term either no i've heard that one as well why, why have you heard it what's <laughs> uh because it was sent to me uh by the ceo uh when he sent me a linkedin message that he then unsent that basically mimicked ken's apology video it was almost like they have probably been having some conversations behind the scenes about how they want to word this and so they were i mean i do think it's incredibly concerning that you would reach out to me send some type of i guess apology um and then unsend it yeah that that does reek of something i felt it was written by an attorney 
No, that's most of it was attorney, attorneys aren't going to use the term loss in this office. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, is there were some key talking points in there that yeah. are very legal ease. And I'm getting Alex Jones vibes from this whole thing. I'm using people to get personal gain mm-hmm. and everything in between. Um, and, and so, so it's almost like this is damage control. And Meredith, that shocks me that they send it to you and then they resend it a private message that just, and Why? don't think I don't have the screenshot. Of course, I took the screenshot. <laughs> Even yeah. if you didn't, you could still get it off of LinkedIn. I was playing with privacy <laughs> settings the other day and pulling all sorts of other stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll um, have a separate conversation about that, Thomas. But <laughs> yes. Um, I, 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 really quickly, like I, I think didn't that, seem sincere. No, yeah, not no, sincere. I, no. I fully agree. It, it seemed like he was doing it because he had to do it. Um, you know, he's actually lost. I think he, he had like 1.1 million followers uh, earlier this week. I checked right before we recorded recorded this episode and he's down to like 1 million. So he still has, you know, decent following, but how many are going to stick around? Uh, we've seen people turn on creators for less. Um, so to me, it's really fascinating, but you know, uh, the, the last thing that I want to say on, you know, kind of this specific topic is um, a lot of businesses, whether you're big or small, especially the larger the corporation is, anything you post online has to go through so many layers of approval. You've got to have social and digital look at it. Um, In my industry, legal has to take a look at it. Uh, In some cases for media response, our business unit leader has to take a look at it. Uh, So did he go rogue on some of these posts or, you know, did, was he advised? Did he get approval? Um, Do you just give someone of that nature carte blanche without doing a full background check on, you know, kind of some of their history? Um, that's problematic to me. So I, I don't buy the video. It, it felt like it was something he needed to do. I don't know that it felt genuine or sincere. And he's now, you know, made all of his accounts private. So I, I will give him a little shred of credit saying that it's his passion project. And I'm all for people chasing their passion projects, that's even no, no, no matter how tinfoil hat it could be, but you don't go public with it. You follow it, you research it, you spend hours watching YouTube videos, researching the Encyclopedia Britannica if you're old. Um, And so I'm for that. Go, keep researching it. Go chase chase that rabbit. Don't take it public. And and to your point, Austin. Get it to the right channels that know what to do with the information if if you've got it, you know? And I think that he actually, if he had just stopped at the beginning of the apology, because in the beginning, it actually started off really well, in my opinion. He was like, I went too far. I am now stopping. Yes. He should have left it right there. The second that he said, even though two times I was almost, that's where it was like, oh, no, 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 no. That's where it turned. And that's where you started to be like, Wait a minute. Like you're still going to talk about how you were almost like listen, I'm I don't I hate it's to not say about it, but him. like right, exactly. No. And so he should have stopped right there and said, "I'm sorry. I know I hurt people and I'm done." And he didn't even have to get into like the authorities have the information because we don't care at this point. No. Yeah. It's 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 what we tell all of our executives when we do media training, get in and out of your response quickly. Don't answer the questions you were asked, answer the question you would want to have been asked. You know, sound bites are important. Um, you know, if you're doing a like an actual TV broadcast, you know, if it's a negative story on you, the news is gonna put what a six second sound bite out there. Get Three. in and out quick. Don't go on for a minute and what was this, a minute and 27 seconds, something like that. I mean, it just opens you up to more problems, just like Meredith pointed out. I, I was going to say this also shows the inexperience he has as a communicator. Um, I had a I had a great great art teacher once upon a time that says the difference between a good artist and a great artist is a good artist a great artist knows when to put the paintbrush down, and, and a good communicator knows when to shut up. And to your point, the first minute or first ten seconds of it, drop the mic, walk away. Yeah. Hey. All right. So we've probably gone on way too much about this but i want to give each of you an opportunity to kind of give a parting thought or a lesson learned whether it's for you know the the people that we've discussed whether it's for our listeners out there whether it's for maybe a business that might be in a similar situation what is your takeaway thomas i'll start with you um 
I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm kind of glad that I didn't know this story was going on until I read the headline in Texas Monthly. And even then, I didn't read the whole article. So I'm thankful for that because I didn't have time or brain power to even think about this. Um, but as, as for, we, we've talked about it before, think before you act, think before you communicate, think before you tweet. And, and that goes for the individual that also goes for the companies. Do your due diligence, check check the background of the, the affiliate or the influencer that you're going to be contracting with um check with 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 your writers and legal and those kind of things do the due diligence that that's really it is slow down to speed up don't go fast for the sake of going fast yeah stay at and like scale at a pace that makes sense don't go all in on it don't rely on just one person you know, to do your marketing. I mean, if you want to have a successful company, it's got to be a team effort. It's got to be collaborative. Um, do your due diligence, you know, check, uh, you know, do background checks on the people, making, make sure that you're partnering with the right person. I believe if you actually go back and look at some of Ken's TikToks, he mentions that he was approached about this startup at a club and that's how he got involved. It, did you meet over, you know, while you were drunk and, you know, just thought the guy was cool and wanted to work with him? Like that's, you know, I think when you look at it, like what is the cost of morality? Is it worth sacrificing your, your morals and your ethics? Uh, no. I mean, I think in some cases, the culture that we live in today, virality is like a drug for people. You know, once they get a taste of that virality, they want more and they keep going back. You know, they keep pushing the envelope. You know, we've talked about this with so many different creators out there. They don't know when to stop. Um, and that's why I do respect some of these creators that have taken a step back a little bit. You know, some of the creators that I absolutely love uh, is a guy named Casey Neistat. He was a guy that posted every single day for 365 days on YouTube took a step back, focus on his business, focus on his family, love him or hate him. Uh, Logan Paul, same thing. You know, he's mm -hmm. a guy that had a really controversial moment, what, 2017, 2018. He was a guy that was vlogging every single day. He's taken a step back. He does a podcast, you know, mostly every day, but he's not posting on YouTube. And now he's really focused on his business and professional growth. So I think with age comes maturity. Know that you know, you can still be a good communicator. You can still be a good fintech guy. You don't have to go viral for everything. Sometimes it's not about you. Sometimes it's about the people around you. So that's my thought. Meredith, take us home. You know, I first got introduced to Ken oh, about five or six months ago when he sort of stole content from uh, a friend of mine who goes by the name of Culture Work on TikTok. She's an incredible content creator, and she had developed a whole theory behind, around Tom and Giselle's divorce and their connections to FTX. She had put in hours of work. It had been picked up by lots of major news sources. And like maybe two weeks later, Ken came in and kind of stole her content. And so that's how I was introduced to him. And I kind of called him out on it, and so did she. But he didn't listen. And he kept doing what he was doing and getting and having no accountability. I think if Ken had taken a minute and listened to what smaller creators were saying to him five or six months ago of like, hey, buddy, you kind of seem like you're stealing work. You kind of seem like you're flying a little clo too close to the sun. I don't think he would have gone down the route that he has gone down. And I think another piece of this is like he stole content from a black woman and we so often don't listen to black women the way that we should. And like Ken, I think based on his tweets probably doesn't listen to women the way that he should. So if he was willing to have a more sort of equitable approach to his content, he probably wouldn't have ended up in the situation that he's in. Nobody probably would have found those old tweets and, two months from now, he would have remembered them and deleted them. So I encourage him, you know, and I think I'm also right there. I, I agree. You have to, if you're going to create content, you also have to be live beyond the app. You have to go out and have real experiences and have real interactions. I went to jury duty today. I'm like, oh my God, I got two months of content just from sitting around that room. <laughs> like, so you have to be out and around in order to like sort of ground yourself and realize like, we are all just bozos on the bus trying yeah. to figure it all out. So that's my closing thought. I like it. And really quickly, were Amazon cameras there in your jury room? 
<laughs> I wish. <laughs> I, I was like, wait a minute. Am I the James Marsden of this group? No, I'm probably the chair pants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna I'm gonna applaud you because as as communicators, and so many times, we we help each other. We really do. Hey, hey, yeah. what you're doing is not cool. Hey, you probably should have edited that. Hey, what's going on for there? And so my my stance is not for most of our listeners who are the seniors, but for the juniors. If someone's giving you advice, especially more than one person's giving you advice, take take the take the time to listen and implement it. I promise you, it'll go further in life. And yeah. the other part to your point is if you want to become a C-suite, live your life. Because when you're at the cocktail party, the 17th cocktail party for the two weeks that you've been on the road, the conversations they're having is not about work. It's about the time they were backpacking in Nepal or rode a bull at some sideshow rodeo or stayed up too late having drinks at a cocktail happy hour and wound <laughs> up at a karaoke bar. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of last words and we'll sign off finally but mandy kane who's a past guest on the show she uh she's a vp at edelman she wrote a uh, book called so you effed up uh maybe we should send a copy to ken um <laughs> i will say he's still young yes we've, we've all screwed up in our lives you know whether it's at work family friends we've all done stuff that we you know wish we could go back and, and do things together uh differently you know i'm firm believer that everything happens for a reason you it's okay to fail right you can fail forward you have to learn from it you have to grow from it so i think this is a defining moment from him um again i'm not saying anything about his investigation if he made stuff up if he exaggerated things but in terms of just the ethical side the moral side of this he made a mistake and i think that's abundantly clear and i think if he could go back and do it all over again he probably would um but I am curious to see if he does learn from these lessons moving forward, um, how he can try to come back from this, I guess. Uh, it, it's going to be a difficult and maybe a costly lesson for him. Um, but he still has time. He's still young. Um, learn from it. Grow from it. Uh, use your experience to help others. That's my thought. Probably stay off social media for you know, a, a couple bit. years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Meredith, we appreciate you for joining us, uh, you know, us two Texans. Here. We wish, oh, uh, we you. wish, yeah, we wish Hattie and uh, Kim could join us, but mm -hmm. not everyone wants to record at 10 o'clock at night, uh, which I totally get. So, um... <laughs> thank you for accommodating my schedule, <laughs> mostly <laughs> accommodating jury duty. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a good story and allowed me to make that joke, which, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. It's on uh, Amazon <laughs> Freebie. <laughs> it's really a hilarious. Plug yeah, for it's, the show, it's it's, 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 not... uh, it's sponsored. <laughs> We we do talk random plugs of what what our guilty pleasures is every now and then, um, and it's we are funny fans. how many people do uh, reference that they're like I like that show too, especially yeah. in a profession where like cool. We are probably the only <laughs> podcast to really discuss Emily in Paris. Um, we don't talk about it from like an acting ability. We're like from the comms, and then we're like, but we love this. And then our our co host Hattie's like, I love her outfits. That's why I watch. And then you know when a new season drops, you know we're texting about it at like midnight and it's kind of embarrassing you know because thomas is married i have a fiance and it's like mm. we're watching emily in paris come on and, and, and the reason we all watch the very first episode is the exact same reason it's a tv show about communications and advertising we got to see if it's accurate or anything like that right? and, then all and, of a sudden, and then you're hooked eight, right eight episodes later <laughs> when's the next season coming out yeah well that's it for Season five, episode mm. five of the Business Communicators. Uh, of course, follow our work uh, at Business Communicator on all the platforms. And, and Meredith, if people want to follow you and connect with you, what's uh, what's the best way to get in touch? You can find me on Instagram or yelling into the void about something that pretty soon is not going to be Ken on TikTok. Also, Meredith M. Lynch. I love it. We'll definitely link to those uh, in the show notes below. But uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of uh, the podcast. Let us know what you think. Hit us up on email. Um, slide into our DMs. We see it all. And uh, I guess on behalf of uh, our guest this week, Meredith Lynch, and my co-host, Thomas Bain, my name's Austin Staten. We'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.